You have found Authentic Business Adventures, the business program that brings you the struggle stories and triumphant successes of business owners across the land, coming to you from the great Carbon 4 Brewery. I'm excited here. We have Zach Koga, the co-owner of Carbon 4. How are you doing today, I'm Zach? I'm doing well. Doing well. Another week. Yeah. <laughs> That's it's how, Monday. Yeah. That's how we owners yeah. do it here. This is a cool space you got here. Thank you. So let's start out with how long have you been here? We are in our ninth year. Uh, so we turned, we, we got eight full years, technically December 28th of 2020. So nice. we're going into our ninth year here. Wow. And, uh, and yeah, many more to come. All right. That's super cool. So you, was this the first spot or did you relocate? This was. It no, was. this was our first spot. We started here. Um, Ale Asylum was here from about somewhere in 2006 mm -hmm. until late summer, All roughly right. late summer, fall of 20. Oh, wait, 2012. Okay. And then we, um, yeah, we moved in. Our lease started October of 2012, and we were open by the end of the year. So about, well, it was almost almost three full months to get us open, but that's pretty fast. I was um, gonna say it's crazy fast. Yeah, we 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 were working 100 hour weeks, just going straight sure. through every day, every night um, to get open, and and we had the benefit of Ellis Island being here before, so a mm -hmm. lot of the a lot of infrastructure things were already here. All right. Drainage, water, boiler right. stuff. So it was more um, rearranging our first equipment setup, um, mixed with some things we bought from them versus things we brought in, and then in the tap room, we they had a functioning tap room here. We ended up kind of gutting it, so we went a little further than we thought we oh, would. But right. uh, but there but there was already half of the bar yeah. was here already. Plumbing things, a lot of things were here, so that helped us get to get to market pretty quickly. Very cool. Is that why you ended up choosing this space, or were you yes. deliberating other spaces as yeah, well? Yeah, we we yes. At the end of the day, that's why we ended up um, in this space in Madison. We were talking about um, how to start a brewery for a couple of years. My brother is really what brings me into the beer business. I was, oh, really? I'm was i an engineer by training and background, and um, my brother was, was brewing beer out in Montana for several years, oh, and wow. as a family, we were talking about how to get a brewery going for ourselves, for him, more more focused for him and for his career, and, and then as that discussion got more real, I was getting kind of more involved, looking at the business plan with him, and, and brought in some friends to, to help us, and. Um, and then Ryan um, cold called Ale Asylum and just kind of said, hey, we're, we're looking to start up a brewery. Madison's definitely on our radar because I'd already lived here. He was mm -hmm. out in Montana and, mm -hmm. and it's a great, great city, great market for craft beer, especially yeah. back then, yeah. almost 10 years ago. And, uh, and we sort of struck a deal to say, hey, I think there's certain things that you're probably just trying to sell and they'd be worth more if they stayed put to both of us. And So at the time you knew Ale Asylum was leaving? Yes. Okay. Yeah, we were aware. I so I worked for Findorf before starting the brewery, and so I was always very aware of real estate development and projects and things All in right. town. So I was I was aware that Ale Asylum was looking to build a new space. Um, at the time, I I knew more about some of their early plans when they were looking at East Washington, mm -hmm. um, but that fell through before they ended up out on the other side of the airport. And yeah. uh, and Ryan was really the one that had the insight to say, hey. They're expanding, and I bet they're going to try to sell some equipment. and And it's a lease space. I know the landlord here. Um, yeah. And uh, and we just you know put things together from there. Right. Yeah. So when Ryan cold call them, were they just like, well, that's good timing. Yeah. I I, I it was luck. I right. mean it it was it was good insight and foresight by Ryan, but it was also some luck because. Um, I mean, I think, you know, we get, as a business owner, you get solicited all day, every day, 24-7, oh, yeah. <laughs> in the mail, on the phone, mm -hmm. employees get harassed, um, people pretending that they knew you from high school and oh, stuff, right? <laughs> and family you've never met. Um, so the fact that Otto just, like, actually took the call was, yeah. was lucky, I think, just to actually get to the office, right. and, then, and then he listened, and it was, I think it was like, wow, that's good timing, yeah. Nice. And was there so. ever any thought... Of like, hey, I don't want to help out a competitor or anything like that. Not, not really. I think there was some concern because we we had we had some conversation about, hey, you're going to change this, right? You're not just going to totally rip us off. Mm -hmm. And 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 we said absolutely. We 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 have our own ideas about what we want to do and what our brand's going to be like. We're definitely going to make changes. So there was a little bit of discussion of like, hey, you're going to at least kind of repaint and redecorate and and make sure it's not 
confusion in the market about it being an ale asylum right. affiliated company. Right. But over overwhelmingly, they were um, really easy to work with and and friendly, and um, and we got through. You know, we got through it. So, nice. That's yeah. super cool. Yeah. Did you end up? I guess as far as their landlord goes, was it complicated? Or was it no. easier because you guys are a brewery, so the landlord yeah. didn't have to get rid of a bunch of stuff? The landlord was, it was that was probably the easiest part. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I mean, he's like, great, and I don't have any vacancy, and it's yeah. the same purpose. And I, he, he probably did pretty well in the deal because when Ale Asylum took it over, I think it was much cheaper space. It wasn't really retail focused right. space, and mm-hmm. and so them turning it into a brewery and having the tap room put mm-hmm. it in, put it in a different category, you know, as hybrid retail rent instead of more like east side warehouse rent right so i think he did okay on it and and we've certainly paid all our bills along the way so we've we have a good relationship and Mm -hmm. it was very simple to get through that part cool yeah i'm gonna pause for a second just make sure this is recording so far we can't see the dog okay (laughs) (laughs) yeah it's just like is that dot on yeah um so as far as the build out and stuff like that goes i remember being in ale asylum and then coming in here thinking this is just going to be the same thing, and it was way different. Yeah. But still, still cool. I mean, Ale Asylum back in the day was cool, and this was a cool place. It's interesting because I have no eye for aesthetics. I, yeah. But I know when I like it. <laughs> kind of thing. Yeah, I feel the same way. We're we're not we're not interior designers or decorators by mm-hmm. any stretch of the imagination, but we certainly developed a point of view. I think our approach coming into the tap room was that we wanted it to be. A, uh, a canvas that we got to build the brand out on and yeah. one of our best friends Tom um, was an early creative force in the company and did all the paintings in the brewery um, and we wanted it to be a canvas for his interpretation on our beer brands as we went oh, nice. so okay. we we told we filled up the space with his paintings every time we would release a beer we'd release a painting with it until we ran out of room basically wow. and, uh, and so that's kind of helped bring it to life a little bit when we also during covid used the opportunity to repaint and clean some things up so right now it's actually kind of a lighter palette than it was when mm-hmm. we first opened it was a little darker um but but that was the concept because we we probably could have done better <laughs> on an interior <laughs> decorating side but we we did what we could do and it worked for a while sure hindsight we're evolving, it's all good. So, yeah i do remember it being really dark in here yeah but i didn't I guess I didn't necessarily consider that a bad thing. It was yeah, it was a bar. I mean, it's, it's a, a bar, bar. tap room. Yeah, <laughs> right. it's not. Yeah, so mm-hmm. it worked. worked. That's cool. So tell me about how it's been working with your brother. I guess it's probably a safe place here. Oh yeah, well, working with family no, is gonna be tough. It, you know, it is, but not. Um, he and I have not had, I think those those typical cliche family problems all the time. Not at a high level. There's certainly. You, you know you disagree on things or you're mm-hmm. both tired or both grumpy and and you get into it on on whatever the sure. issue is but mm-hmm. we've he and i have um it's never been like that that kind of cliche problem that's, that's like awesome. boy we're just gonna never talk again and not get over it and <laughs> um slamming we, doors we've been able kids. yeah we've been able to separate how tired or frustrated or whatever it is with mm-hmm. the problems and with the issues versus each other we've we've always been able to to keep those things kind of separate it, it's definitely evolved our relationship because we're working together every day and so yeah. instead, instead of goofing off as brothers you know and and when we go home and be social we're getting to do that separately so you know it, it certainly changed like how often we might just hang out because mm-hmm. we're together all sure. the time um but <laughs> I think we both really valued all the time we got to spend together too, because we're we're just totally in tune on like everything with yeah. each other. You know, we know each other inside out, up and down, at our best and at our worst, and and we have each other's back. You know, we really well, that's just cool. unequivocally support each other. If you get a phone call at ten o'clock, something broke, we're both we're both no questions asked. We'll work through the night, fix it, whatever mm-hmm. has to be done. So, mm-hmm. um, I think I think the way to survive that is just to to never give up you know on the problems and if you don't do that then you're not ultimately betraying each other and then you don't get into those fair. tough problems you know totally as long fair. as you're both in the fight together you're yeah. in the fight together so i want to back up a step to when he's in montana and you at the time are in madison mm-hmm. working for findorf did he reach out to you and say hey let's start a brewery 
No, it, no, it wasn't like that so much. It was more um, an evolution, I okay. would say. We, he had gotten a master's in, in strength and conditioning out at MSU Billings and initially started working at a brewery um, for a part-time job just to pay the bills and, and while he was in school. All right. Wasn't a huge beer guy. Um, has always been a cheap date. Doesn't drink a lot of alcohol in general. Um, but he he was on the bottling line and had uh, had their Black Widow oatmeal stout like short fill off the line mm-hmm. with lunch, and had a real moment of clarity about like, oh my gosh, this is like <laughs> totally different than the beer I've been familiar with All growing right. up, and felt. I've been lied to about what beer is and what it should be and what it could <laughs> be and isn't all these macro things. Macro light beer. Yeah, this isn't this isn't whatever you know light. And uh, so he started to get really passionate about it. He's he's a very sort of passion driven guy, um, artistic guy, but also very technical um, mm-hmm. person. And and it was a real outlet for him. It was such a muse that once he stumbled into this, wow, beer could be these other things. You mm-hmm. know, realization. He, he really ran at it pretty quickly and by the time he was out of school he was he was working his way um, you know towards brewing and ultimately being the head brewer out at Yellowstone Valley Brewing Company and, wow. and being a pretty major person running the operations there and he's and he was getting better at his craft he was getting better at his seasonal program he was getting you know out in the community and mm-hmm. and, and uh, his bright personality was you know creating a following and and so as as just a family talking you know about life along the way, student debts you know starting to be due and and you know i want to get married and start a family and and it was this question of okay are you going to keep doing this you know how serious are you about this and and um i think we should be looking for opportunities with a little higher ceiling and um it so it was a real evolution i mean all the way up until working through the business plan he was still looking for opportunities to maybe go back to pa school or or get get another job you know associated with his education and yeah um w- once we stumbled on this being an exact opportunity in this location with this timeline uh, things started to fall into place faster and we got okay. a lot more confident about hey this is a real plan with a real location with a real timeline you know and it, it gave a lot of foundation to our plan and then and then we went out and pitched an investor um, and the first one we met with said yes, and we were like, "Oh wow!" The first one. Yeah, the first one. So we now he ultimately ended up not being a partner of ours. So I still I feel like I credence. still yeah. But it gave us a ton of confidence totally. that, to have somebody say this is the plan. And I I still remember he looked right at us and he said, "So you guys are the guys?" And we said yes. And he said, "I'm in." And we're we're like, "Wow, what what just happened?" <laughs> are you sure? Yeah, yeah. What just happened? <laughs> us. And uh, I still. Oh, that guy a bottle of scotch or something i think because we um i don't know if we ever we didn't really talk much after that because plans started accelerating in another direction and Mm -hmm. um but it gave us tons of confidence to say we're doing this this isn't an if thing this is a when thing and Mm -hmm. um and and we we accelerated from there and and uh and got it going so it wasn't so much him calling and saying let's do this it was more of just this ongoing discussion Mm -hmm. you know what are we doing are you going to do this and then it it really wasn't my focus um initially but just as time kept going on i got more involved in Mm -hmm. helping structure the business plan ryan had this real brilliant friend out in montana that was helping too, helping him just kind of get the business plan organized and um and we started working with our friend alex who brought him in to um to help as well he was in between things and and had some some more time to throw into it to help make sure we stayed aggressive on on making it happen and, all right um did your brother ever have to sell you on it like dude this is really happening kind of thing no no or was there ever like you were at the time working at findor so you had a yeah. pretty decent job i yeah i was really busy <laughs> <laughs> i i was really busy and my job at findor was going very well mm-hmm. I, I it's a great company um I mean, my plan was to to try to be an owner there. You know, yeah. I, I really, I had I had kind of big dreams, no matter where they were. You know, mm-hmm. and before all of that, I wanted to play professional baseball. Then I, as I switched away from that, I was like, oh, I'm going to be an engineer and I want to own the construction firm. You know, or be nice. a developer and own the buildings. And I, I always had that kind of itch to to be in control of my destiny a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was going really well. But I I was having a bit of a quarter life crisis that I. 
I was I was managing a, a big big project in Milwaukee. Um, I had to have been about the youngest guy running a high rise project in, a, right. in an urban city in the country, and 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 I I had this just sort of quarter life crisis moment yeah. of like, what is this it? You know, is this <laughs> I'm just going to chase the same sort of thing for the next 20 years or right. 30 years, and it, it freaked me out a little bit, and I was getting more and more of an itch to do something entrepreneurial. Um, so the the brewery really gave me an outlet because I didn't really know what it would be if I did something sure. else. It, I just knew that I could bring project management and business and engineering skills to something. Yeah. And and uh, and the brewery was was the outlet um, for me at the time. And, nice. Yeah. That sounds like a lot of stars aligned really well. Oh yeah, it very much because because it wasn't Ryan's big master plan. You yeah. know when he went out to Montana either and. Um, a lot of things had to come together, and at the end of the day, it's just willpower. Totally. Oh, I mean, I think times over. that's 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 the secret to all of life. You know, ideas mm-hmm. are a dime a dozen. I think a lot of people overvalue ideas. It's it's execution and willpower. Totally. I was talking it's, with the guy. Yeah. He's like, I'm an idea man. I'm like, everyone's an idea. Everybody <laughs> has an idea. I mean, we could sit here together. I was listening to somebody make a comment like. You know, if we sat down for an hour, we could probably chart out everything that's going to happen over the next like 50 to 100 years. Sure. You know, you can talk about AR, mm-hmm. VR, all the electrical stuff and digital things and and the way crypto's going and NFTs. And it's mm-hmm. not that hard to see where all of these things are going and, mm-hmm. and what our life could be like. It, it's execution. I mean, it's right. there's really not. Yeah. You, you don't need to wait around for ideas. You just need to do things and turn yeah. it into business. And, and it's really hard. It's still very hard for us today. I mean, mm-hmm. just to stay relevant, to stay in business. Um, really, we're, I still feel very much like a startup. I don't feel like we figured out. After nine years. Oh, yeah. I don't feel like we've hardly even right. gotten started. Yeah. I can totally. My business is nine years as well. And I can say that there are days. <laughs> this is day two. Yeah. Like, we, have we learned nothing? We've learned nothing. Yeah. We, there's so many things that we do wrong or not, yeah. not as well as I'd like to. And mm-hmm. I, I sp- talk with a lot of people um, that have the same dream I did. You know, if I was in charge, <laughs> I would just do all of these things. Yeah. It would be so perfect. Easy. It would be utopia. And, and then you start doing it and realize, oh no, it's messy and complicated. And mm-hmm. really, the whole magic is: can you operate it? Not, mm-hmm. not do you have ideas or have dreams or utopian visions. It's more like: can you grind it day in and day out? Right. Can you can you make small steps forward mm-hmm. and make more of them forward than backward? And, mm-hmm. um, are you willing yeah. to? Are you willing to? Yeah. Are and is your family willing to go along for that ride? I mean, great segue because yeah. that was the next yeah. question. How are you married, or were you married at the time? I so the year we opened, I I, I opened that high rise building in Milwaukee. I got married, and we opened the brewery within three months of each other. Nice. I so I didn't sleep for about three months. Wow. <laughs> you know, it, um, it was a great year. So, uh, so I am your... married. I have three daughters now. Oh, uh, nice. My my wife Laura uh, and I live out in Wanakee now. We have three little girls beautiful girls Mm -hmm. we um at the time she was i forgot to add she was getting her doctorate in nursing (laughs) that year as well she had she'd gone back to school um so she was an rn in school to get her doctorate to be a nurse practitioner i I was just killing myself driving to milwaukee and back every day running that project Mm -hmm. opened the brewery got married um and then when we had our first daughter uh about a year and a half later, that was the moment that I knew I had to quit my day job at Fendor. Okay, so yeah. I, I was going to ask you when you when you walked into that office and said, "Hey." That was the hardest thing. I, I bet. Oh, I, I that was. I don't know if it's the hardest thing, but like one of the hardest things in my life. I'll never forget. I, I was absolutely dreading um, having that discussion because, like I said, I, I was really working my tail off there mm-hmm. I, it was a great company I was treated well I felt like I was on the right path to, to be in a leadership position there mm-hmm. um, and I was I was overseeing a handful of pretty large projects that were kind of coming down the pipeline and and to have to walk in and I know just r- really you know ruin the day for my boss to be like sorry I'm I have to go and like yeah. there's all this stuff I'm dealing with for you <laughs> and I'm gone here's uh, my stack of headaches yeah like sorry um it was it was pretty tough um 
a guy I really admire, Jim Yaley. He's now the president and CEO of Findorf. Mm-hmm. That, that's who I went and talked to. I had my box all packed up in case they just had to walk me out because mm-hmm. I respect that. You know, sometimes you have to just do that. But right. since I was changing industries, it was a little easier to say, let's just transition you out over like a two-week period and help. Mm-hmm. I can help, you know, with the transition and yeah. help them figure out how to reallocate the workload. And um, so very difficult decision, but it was the most clarity I've ever felt in my life, I think, was like the, the moment my daughter Sloan was born. It was just, it was a very weird kind of out-of-body experience for a lot of reasons, I think, maybe mm-hmm. a lot of parents mm-hmm. um, could, could relate to, but for me in particular, just going crazy about what should I do? Should I leave my job? It right. was just, it was immediate. I quit. I, I cannot, the risk of missing more time with this girl. Right. Your priorities changed. Oh, it just changed. It was just yeah. not even close. I'm you don't like, even get a it's, choice it's in the matter. It's not even close. Yeah. yeah, like it just wasn't a problem. I, mm-hmm. I can always, I can always work. Mm-hmm. I can't, you know. This is my daughter. Right. So. They're only young ones. Can yeah. Be. Yeah. That's fair. Yeah. So, how long were you with Findorf then? About seven years, six or seven okay. years. I intern. I started interning pretty full time, interning in college, and then just transitioned wow. right out of college. So somewhere like oh seven to somewhere in oh seven. Six or seven to um, April of fourteen. So okay. Like six, six, seven years. All right. That. Yeah. Dang. It's the time when you get in the car after you have that conversation. You're like, <laughs> I yeah. It was. Yeah. <laughs> it was liberating because mm-hmm. it just to make a decision and move forward. Right. But it was. It was pretty horrifying because I just I felt like I had really let Jim down and, True, and my fair. and my coworkers there that that they wouldn't understand I'm leaving you know because mm-hmm. we're all these like uh, I don't know self abusing engineer types in the construction <laughs> industry like sure. very dutiful work really hard you know there's nothing better than building projects we love projects and and I I am that person I I love that but. Yeah. But to leave and start a brewery, it was kind of like, what? You know? What are you doing? Yeah. So. <laughs> That's awesome. But they were cool about it. They're very cool about it. Still supportive. I still work. They do small. They do small projects for us around the brewery. Still, um, there's guys just up the road at the Eurofins building that they just built. They, the project team comes down to get beers after work oh, sometimes. Nice. And um, so no, no bad blood. It's none at all. It's none at all. Life I, is all about choices. It's just that yeah, it was just a veer in my path. You know, mm-hmm. they're a great company. No bad blood at all. Yeah. yeah. I interviewed Chad over at Findorf. Oh, good guy. On this guy. podcast. Yeah, really great cool. guy. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a cool company. Very much. So interesting. It's overwhelming some of the projects they do. But Yeah. Um, talking about overwhelming, let's shift into employees. Yeah. So <laughs> you start this brewery, you get the space, you're all building out, now you got to hire people. How did that go? Um initially it was exciting and and great and kind of easy because we had a small group you know it's really just um alex was here day to day and our friend tom the artist uh was was behind the bar like a bar manager right away for us so Mm -hmm. it was our small group of of guys that were pretty focused ryan could do all the production we needed to do by himself because we were just kegging beer at the time and, and most of the backspace was empty so it was a pretty small group we had a couple extra people helping bartend and cook Mm -hmm. um and that that team started to grow and over the next six to twelve months and and a lot of those early headaches Alex dealt with you know it wasn't me dealing with um, nice and you know but it it pretty quickly becomes clear you know how important your people are it, Hugely. it's, it's uh, you know you can't we early on we were here every weekend you know Saturday so we we would be closed Sundays just to give ourselves a, a mm-hmm. day away and mm-hmm. um, you know once you start to realize like hey we really got to figure out how to have people around helping us get this done or we're never gonna make it we're never gonna grow we're gonna burn out mm-hmm. um, so yeah but it's people's really the whole thing I think in the end yeah without them yeah you have a job yeah it takes a lot of time so. yeah yeah and speaking of ceiling Right when it's just you, there's only so many hours in a day. So when you start adding people, you can raise that ceiling. Oh yeah, yeah. It's the whole game. It's the it's that execution you right. know, that I mentioned. That really mm-hmm. most of that is just can you find a way to right. to bring together a group of people to mm-hmm. do something, whatever yeah. it is, get organized and do it. Yeah. Yep. So I know that I when I first started my businesses, 
Uh, the employee thing was something that I did not know was such a headache. I learned the hard way. So did you know from project managing and stuff like that that employees could be a challenge? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, You're lucky. <laughs> yeah. I, so the when I would manage teams, it was e- each little project was like its own little mini company within okay. it, when, in general contracting. So like the last project that I completed, Modern over in Milwaukee, we had a, like a project management team. I don't know, about a half a dozen people. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, at peak, we probably had four or 500 people on the job site. And I think overall worked with two or 3,000, you know, different oh, people wow. touching the job. And, and you know, you have all the, the foremen and the superintendents and the project managers of all those other various subcontractors. Mm-hmm. So being in a team environment was never, that was not a shock at all. all right. um, the probably the the bigger thing i i was to be honest i was a much better manager in that life than i am here because it it's people but it's not just it's not just people it's the fact that you're really responsible right every part of that yeah payroll Mm -hmm. hr the health insurance the unemployment issues the the everything issues Mm -hmm. it that all of that and then and then career development and Mm -hmm. morale and direction and um yeah the whole culture yeah and and then in this business it's real dynamic because you have you have different things going on you have your manufacturing staff Mm -hmm. versus your you know um versus your tap room and front of house staff and Mm -hmm. even in the front of house there's this dynamic between when we used to have our kitchen open and the and the the front of house back of house and Mm -hmm. our retail component that you, you just have these very different little subcultures yeah. you know, within one business that, mm-hmm. and, um, and then to deal with all of these issues that really made me appreciate when I was at Findorf how much stuff was being handled for mm-hmm. us to run jobs. Mm-hmm. All of the administrative and accounting and HR and the training and the, it, the, the other stuff. I, I, I think people would be really kind of surprised, shocked at how much... Um, Bad news comes to you as the owner of the company. Oh, yeah. You're pretty much in the bad news business, right? Yes. The fire, the All fire putting out. It's if it's bad, if it's really bad, that's like everything we get, and mm-hmm. it's always really bad when it's a bad thing with a person, whether you know they have like a family member pass away, or you know dealing with COVID and trying mm-hmm. to keep keep us moving forward, but without taking undue risk and mm-hmm. um, trying to make sure you take serious, you know, your your role as as the person taking responsibility for their job. Right. Um, without being taken advantage of cuz mm-hmm. <laughs> firing's really difficult, hiring's right. really difficult. So oh my god. Yeah, it, it's crazy. Team yeah, the team dynamic wasn't a shock, but all of those other things was mm-hmm. is still it can be very overwhelming. Yeah. I imagine in a place like this just the culture alone is probably tough to manage. Yeah. Because you want, especially, I don't know what it's like now, but a year, year and a half ago, when unemployment was so low, it was tough to find people. Very difficult. Very difficult. And you, you would have, there's always a certain amount of people that that are sort of professional at gaming the system, mm-hmm. you know, at, at applying or maybe applying so that they can still justify getting yep. unemployment or, or they have to show up for maybe one shift. Yeah. And just to extend Cost their hours of unemployment. Paperwork you know benefits so that they can you know keep staying on that and they did they they bail out on us and now that's that's more of the exception but it is a it is a dynamic of of the of the industry and Mm -hmm. um you know overwhelmingly though people are are here doing a great job and they're Mm -hmm. not trying to take advantage of anything they're really trying to help grow the brand they're excited about beer they're excited about the fun branding that we have, we mm-hmm. we try to keep we try to keep in balance a, a, some chaos, you know, because I think sure. a lot of people are in the beer industry because they want it to be a little bit more wild, a little bit you know less structured, a little more creative, a little more of like riding the riding the dragon here of yeah. you know of creativity and whatever our brand gets to be, and um, that can be an interesting balance of trying to bring less formality into a business structure and allow, wow. and allow for more a little more chaos without it being a total mess right you know that's a, a balance that we ryan and i've talked about a lot of what we don't want to have too many policies and things because we want people to 
they're here for a reason. If, mm-hmm. they, if they wanted a bunch of structure, they'd go sell insurance or something right. and probably make more money. But they're here because they don't want to be miserable. Mm-hmm. They, they want to be feel a little bit more alive. And right. we, it, but it's a real balance. It's a real balance. Oh, that's interesting. Um, it's interesting dynamic, I guess, that you stated there because in my industry, our rule is to systematize everything. Yeah. I'm like, there's there's something to be said about what you got going on. I might have learned something here. I, yeah, <laughs> I, I feel you. Yeah. Engineering's the same way. I was all about how efficiently can we build a building, how, mm-hmm. how cheaply, how uh, not inexpensively, I should say, not cheaply, inexpensively, fast. Like, Every, it comes everything, everything with speed and efficiency and lean, and, and right. here it's okay. We have that stuff. We need, we do need procedure and process to repeatably make good beer, mm-hmm. to do a lot of things right. But we have to be real careful not to steal the soul. Because right. the whole business is based on totally. That here. Yeah, yeah. I can see if you're building a building, there's certain there's rules that you want to follow if you want the building to stay up. Yeah. Whereas beer, there's probably more. There's somewhat of an art, and it's also a lot of customer service. Yes. Which there are guidelines, but they don't necessarily have to be. Um, it's hard rules, yeah. It, or something like that. Yeah, can, there's there like can be no, personality in there. Yes. It it it, it requires personality. Mm-hmm. It requires authenticity and. And authenticity requires people to be to, to inject themselves into the solutions, mm-hmm. into the service, and, and to be real with people. Yeah. Um, but we, you know, we fail all the time at that stuff. It's a really, it's a really kind of wild balance of enough structure, enough guidance, so mm-hmm. that people aren't totally confused or feel like they're floating through space with what we're trying to do. <laughs> which, which honestly, we, you know, we fail it all the time. But, mm-hmm. but um, I think we. We tend to slightly err on that that loose grip side, you sure. know, to try to keep. Because at the end of the day, we also think that the most talented people will find ways to shine if there's a little fair. less control. Totally we fair. might we might find that person that could just change the game. Yes, that is a thousand times over. Yeah. Totally agree with that. Tell me about the name. Where did the name Carbon Four? Carbon Four. <laughs> that was six months of. Discussion of long wow. discussion of we probably spent more time talking about what our name should be than anything else in that that pre-planning stage. That was the battle. That well, it was it was it was more of this discovery than it was like total battle. I think we were all a little bit confused on what what did we really want? Because mm-hmm. to take it back, we we had discovered this space and this this exact plan mm-hmm. at the end of 2011 was when Ryan had called, I think when we came to meet with Hill Asylum and the landlord was the Halloween of 2011. Okay. So by, I think about March of 2012, we, we had financing and lease signed and everything figured out. Wow. Well, we had from March 2012 until October to move in. All right. And they were here, so there's nothing we could do. Yeah. It was just talking. It was so just a waiting game. We spent those six, seven months just totally focused on... What's our branding? I mean, there were certainly equipments and, and things that we were also, you know, putting together, Ryan mm-hmm. was shopping for and stuff, but a lot of what we were talking about were, what's our brand? What's it gonna, whatever. What's it gonna be, look like, feel like, sound like? What's our approach? What's our strategic approach and, you know, beers we're gonna bring out? What, what's gonna be our first lineup? How are we gonna do seasonals? And, mm-hmm. and uh, the, the brand, we we knew that we wanted something scalable that we didn't want to be painted into a corner with yeah. like a a thematic brand. I think the joke is that we always said we don't want like a Disney ride brand. Oh sure. You know if it's like Cottage Brewing Company and then everything's like canoe paddle and paddle bolt and what right. you know it's like all these themes. Well, we mm-hmm. we didn't want to do that. We don't want to be painted into a corner because we didn't. Who are we going to be in five ten years? You know we want something that'll grow with us. Mm-hmm. And and who do our customers say we are? Because the the brand, the the sort of spirit of, of our brand and who we were going to be as a company was going to be defined by our employees and by our customers right. and by us all together, mm-hmm. trying stuff, you know, failing. Succeeding. And that could evolve, right? It'll yeah, it has to. Yeah, we really wanted to. So we needed a point of view, and it needed to be us, but it needed to be something that would grow and and mm-hmm. scale and wouldn't pigeonhole us. And so that led us to kind of want to and sort of invent a word you know or find a brand yeah. that didn't feel like it meant anything until right. except for us and um this idea of elemental carbon being the foundation of our physical existence and and then beer being the foundation of civilization uh-huh. um, was this this idea that it was very elemental that it was very um 
I like to say principled but not traditional. So very um, limitless potential, even right. though very principled fundamentals. All um, right. So elemental carbon was there was an idea that was captured by that, mm -hmm. but we didn't want to sound like a biotech company, <laughs> and it just didn't look right to us. The regular, you know, C A R B O N, where you know both me being an engineer, Ryan being like pre med. Ochem, you know, mm -hmm. very technical with with chemistry and biology, with just didn't feel like a brewery. And right. um, our friend Tom wrote, we had this long list of ideas, and he had he had written carbon twelve one time, all lowercase carbon, but spelt it K R B E N, and then one two, and it was like it was on the list, but it wasn't a real serious contender. Mm -hmm. But I think we all sort of secretly had our eye on it because. All of a sudden, it came back to the top and was like, you know, this really captures this idea we keep talking about, this mm -hmm. very like limitless potential idea, and um, and but but we wanted to change the the number and, um, and and so we started debating the finer points of that. But I think we were sitting at Salatai and Fair Oaks having an awesome meal and, yeah. and a few beers, and and we just agreed. We're like, it's carbon four. We're just doing it. You know, we like. We like the smelling. We like the way it sounds and looks, and we mm -hmm. like we like K four shortened and nice. um, and we felt like it could be, it wouldn't bring any preconceived bias or notion, you know, mm -hmm. to to itself. You'd just kind of say, what what's that? And it, <laughs> so it's one of those like it can only mean us. It can only mm -hmm. be one thing because it's a little bit strange. Um, and, and carbon four could be carbon four brewing. Could be carbon four distilling. Mm -hmm. It you know we could. We could have we could really grow with it so yeah it's really just meant to be a thing that we like pushed away from the dock and we'll see where it goes but but that's some of the, the inspiration for it so. so i have to apologize because i'm not a chemist mm -hmm. so the four is that representative of anything it i mean yes and no at at the end of the day from a brand strategy standpoint no it means nothing okay i think a lot of people oh there must be four of you or right. there are four valence electrons in sure. carbon <laughs> and that's part of why it you know bonds the way it does and why it's so foundational so probably the closest inspiration is the valence electrons and carbon okay. but it's not meant to be literal it's, gotcha. it's okay. meant to be a brand and we like the way it looked and the angularity with the k and sure and the sound so it's just um, a name don't read into it's it. it's really just a name it's meant to be its own thing and uh I you know we can be a little grumpy about that sometimes because it always gets misspelled. If, oh, there, yeah, if there's a space between carbon and four, we hate it. But sure. together we loved it, so it we really didn't pick a great brand for a lot of those little <laughs> like nuisance reasons. Sure. Um, and and when we explain it to people, usually they kind of stare at us blankly, and it's like, so are there four of you? It's like no. <laughs> <laughs> One more time. Um, but but uh, yeah, it's meant to be its own thing. All right. It's cool. Its own thing. Cool, cool. Yeah. Let's talk about the beer. So you guys start out, I imagine your brother had some ideas for flavors oh, or yeah. styles of beer. Yeah. So how was that figured out, he, like the so first batches? Ryan was the lead on that all the way. He he had a whole bunch of different beers that, that he knew he wanted to make, and and we, we deliberated over um, what would be sort of our early attempt at flagship versus some seasonal programs. So right. What we did is we brought out, um, I believe we brought out five flag, the, the idea was the first five were going to be flagship type beers, and it was our Night Call Smoke Porter, um, our our Tokyo Sauna was a Rye PA, or I'm sorry, Samurai Rye PA, later we evolved to Tokyo Sauna, um, Undercover Session Ale, Lady Luck Imperial Red, called it an Irish Red at that point, and block party amber ale so we wanted the spectrum of of like just good well executed staple beers and then we mm -hmm. we knew ipas were really important back then but mm -hmm. we, we didn't want to just be stuck with one we we wanted to bring it out as a regular rotator so mm -hmm. our plan was that we were going to have like a, a ipa slot in the calendar but have it change seasonally oh nice and our second ipa in that lineup was fantasy factory oh it's the big one and yeah the world would not let us stop making that beer so that's <laughs> that's a good problem yeah today it's 75 percent of our business so Is it I, yeah, really? i'm trying we're still trying to work to diversify a little better but it just took off and never turned back wow. so we make other stuff well, yeah we make hundreds of other beers but that's 
overwhelmingly the big volume. It might be the label. Yeah, it might be. Yeah. It's a fantastic it label. Be. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. So is is your brother the one that chooses the stuff or does that deliberate throughout the employees or customer? At this point it's a it's it comes from all over the place. There's okay. inspiration, tons of inspiration from the team internally. Um, there's collaborative projects, you know, or, or people outside that, that have ideas. Um, I mean, I guess at the end of the day, it's mostly Ryan and I talking about mm -hmm. what, what do we want to make versus what's going on in the world around us, what have we already made, you know, and make sure that whatever we're bringing out is kind of in context of where does it fit in our program and yeah. how do we want to bring it and what do we want to call it. Sometimes we have real clear direction on a name and a, and a style of beer other times we we know we really want a certain style and we struggle a bit for the name and mm -hmm. um it it's a free-flowing process constantly and now we're we're stretched way beyond beer where there's this whole beyond beer category that hard seltzers and oh sure higher alcohol seltzers and at some point in the future cannabis you know infused right. products of certain types kombucha tea you know there's all these beyond beer things mm -hmm. that we're really excited about so yeah. um i'd say our plan right now is is to find the right way to sort of narrow in our focus on our beer schedule and and um make sure we just really love every every beer that's sticking around on our calendar and not mm -hmm. make sure there's no filler space and, right. then, and then also grow these some of these other segments alongside of it nice so that's cool yeah, it's interesting. They always seem to be coming out. They oh, right? constant. Yeah, it's always some change. The the pace of innovation and change in craft is unbelievable. Yeah. When we first started, there were eighteen hundred breweries in the country. There are now like approaching ten thousand. Over the, the course and, of ten years. Yeah, and and the the amount of different beers that those breweries are making has <laughs> also grown. Um, 10 times at a minimum i mean maybe wow. 50 times i mean it we when we first started we would we had you know five to seven beers that we might be offering mm -hmm. and we had like initially just fantasy factory and package and then we'd add just one more block party or lady luck now we we could put 40 or 50 different beers in a package a year every wow. year and there are breweries that put out like anywhere from two to four a week Holy cow. And they and they make just a tiny amount of it, and then they scatter it to the wind, and, sure. and they do that twice a week to try to sort of reverse engineer some volume. Um, so it's a very different game than, right. than it used to be, and it it's almost it, well, it's basically impossible to actually find something truly unique right. as a producer. If you make something, I mean, every every fruit combination and and yeast combination has pretty much been. Right. tried a hundred times at this point so I, I think I think we're getting to a place in craft where we really have to like make sure you narrow in on your point of view and and the things that you're best at sure and, and make sure to build that that solid core business and then so that you don't lose the soul kind mm -hmm. of the chaos element of before like really design your seasonal program yeah um, in context of all this stuff going on right like yeah. what's your niche yeah kind of thing okay yeah. interesting tell me i want to shift into marketing yeah so when you first started your business you had to get known and you had to say hey we're not ill asylum you had to say we're new on the block yeah like how did you go about marketing and getting the the name out there both retail wise and on store shelves um retail wise it was it was kind of early days of Facebook and okay. and starting to put out some video content like on a Facebook page and mm -hmm. did a little bit a little bit of paid direction just to like make sure that hey we're this new page on Facebook mm -hmm. exists and so so definitely bought a few clicks early on just to sort of put us on people's sure. I don't think there was even a news feed back then put us on whatever that was I can't remember 10 right. years ago okay. <laughs> but okay. to help just say hey we're here so there was a little bit of that the, the sort of like gen one social media stuff mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and and then the rest of it was just community outreach we we um we we hooked up with the the madison homebrewers and tasters guild they're the people that put on great taste and, and we right. got got on their radar early 
to uh, get into the great taste our first year. We worked, we got into the Isthmus Beer and Cheese Festival oh, nice. on our grand opening day. So we had just opened, but but Alex back channeled with Isthmus to get us into that festival so that wow. we could be at the festival. Yeah. So getting out to festivals and tastings of every kind we could, you know, mm-hmm. and it was be us behind the behind the stand serving beer, talking about yeah. the beer till we were blue in the face. Interesting. So it was a lot of that grassroots kind of guerrilla style, mm-hmm. just sampling people, and then trying to create, you know, beer release stuff here in the tap room, mm-hmm. um, where we had a soft opening December twenty eighth, and then every week for the next five weeks we had a beer release leading up to our grand opening and a beer release. So wow. uh, tried to create buzz around new beers and a new tap room in town and mm-hmm. um worked with the um oh my gosh what was their name it was a it was a club or i don't know if they'd call it a guild i can't remember what it was called now but it was like a mustache and beard guild or something oh really that we that we did a big party with here because we undercover our beer was like mustache themed and oh, uh, funny. so we threw this big party and all these guys with crazy beards and mustaches came in and did like a big sort of like beauty competition standing on the bar you nice. know rating their beards and stuff uh so it was, it was just dumb <laughs> stuff like that you know, yeah. it was guerrilla marketing stuff and then we we knew that we wanted to first try to focus on getting people into the tap room so that we could personally meet people across the bar so you had that first person interaction mm-hmm. so you had your lowest ceiling revenue in the tap room by fire by far the highest margin All right. and then you have your first person brand mm-hmm. interaction with everybody introduce ourselves right over the bar then it was self distribution keg only um, in the Madison area where Alex and Tom would go out and sell and deliver beer to the bars directly so from from the brewery yeah but now it's now it's the 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 brewery guys talking to the bar buyers the bartenders and things at bars and restaurants in madison so you had that second person interaction for Mm -hmm. people drinking our beer yeah and but you have a little bit higher little higher volume a little lower profit and and then assigned a a distributor so that they would take over that sales role Mm -hmm. so you get into that more third person interaction with the brand but you create some more scale and then we wanted that to play out for a little while before we put beer in package because we really wanted to make sure that we focused on on draft business meeting people as directly as we could before we before we have this like call it fourth person interaction of a package sitting on the shelf right who knows you know people picking it up may or may not know who we are where we are right. where we're from um and and allow more development to to come along you know in our in our story before putting stuff in package and then um and then buy us time to find our fire breathing unicorn in package right. too so <laughs> that's um, awesome that at the end of the day that really launched the growth of our business yeah. much bigger so we, we really hunkered down for about a year and a half to do that that smaller scale direct sales right. stuff with kegs yeah and then once we put that fire breathing unicorn on a package and and got package out on the shelves mm-hmm. we, we really just were off to the races nice so. i love that how you built upon your success like yeah. that that's super cool that is awesome um what is the biggest challenge that you've had to overcome through all this? You're talking nine plus years. Um, I don't know. I I think um, certainly going from two thousand breweries to ten thousand breweries and from, <laughs> and from ten skews to a hundred skews a year. Oh wow! That that rapid pace of evolution you mm-hmm. know on the shelf and just in the space has been um a pretty difficult regular pressure to, right. to overcome and to stay mm-hmm. in front of um you know i think we grow as as individuals uh, totally. quite a bit so just growing and, mm-hmm. and turning from this you know even though we still i you know like i said i feel like we're infants like just getting going but right. the reality is we we have gone from it's it's just us to more of a company and we have mm-hmm. you know anywhere from i don't know 25 to 40 people on payroll sure. pre-covid we had more like 40 now we've been kind of trying to build back some of those numbers but right. um we do have a lot of people involved and process involved so just evolving as structurally you know how should we best manage ourselves and right. and and that that balance of 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 leadership and guidance and, and allowing for growth in the mm-hmm. company and um, so I think 
yeah, there, there's the competition side, the evolving side, just the, the people issues. Even as owners, the, the three of us, the dynamics change quite a bit. And mm-hmm. and I'd, I'd mentioned our friend Alex a couple of times. He's he's no longer involved in, in the company. Okay. So there's a, you know, evolving through that sort of stuff. And mm-hmm. um, and, and now, I, I think focus is the big challenge. That's where uh-huh. I'm at. I, I heard, I think it was Jack Dorsey. I, there was a reference in a podcast or a book or something, but Jack Dorsey, the Twitter CEO, mm-hmm. he, I think it was him, that he's, he refers to himself as the chief editing officer. That okay. It really, his job is to edit. You know, we should be, you know, the things that we have to say no to is my job as a leader. Uh-huh. And that was a real, like, that was a real light in my brain. Of yeah. Like, oh, my gosh, I need to stop throwing out so many ideas and start taking away ideas so that we can... Right flourish with more focus so interesting i like that yeah that's clever twitter seems to be doing okay uh, yeah <laughs> well and he cash app too and um square i think is him so he's a pretty smart guy pretty All busy right. guy if he's in yeah. square he's definitely doing okay yeah <laughs> apparently his money and credit card processing <laughs> yeah and crypto cash app selling crypto so Ooh, no. yeah nice cool well this has been super awesome yeah where can people find you i know I know well, where we're we are, but yeah, the tap room here's on the east side of Madison at 3698 Kinsman Boulevard. We're kitty corner from the McDonald's on 51. The DMV's across the road there too. Um, so the tap rooms here open seven days a week. On the shelf, we're available all over the state. Um, nice. And a little bit of Minneapolis and Rochester, Minnesota, and and maybe some other Midwest states over time here. But primarily, we're focused on Wisconsin, and we're we're available in every corner of the state. Uh, Woodman's, Quick Trip, mm-hmm. uh, Pick and Saves, um, uh, all the all the big chains. Walmart's really been a great partner here over the last nice. couple of years, expanding our distribution. Festival's been a great partner. Um, uh, other other independent shops like the the Sendix and the um, now I'm going to start leaving people out. The Metcalfs have been great. Sure. Um, so just tons of. <laughs> um, but most 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 places you can buy beer in the state, you're gonna yeah. find something from us. So, That's awesome. Yeah. And seltzer. I think that alone has got to be an accomplishment. Yeah. Well, been it's a lot of work. S- stories of other breweries that are trying to get in places and stuff like that. It's yeah. Just, it's a lot of work. Mm-hmm. A lot of hitting the ground. So That's cool. Yeah. Do you guys have a website? We do. Carbon4.com. And carbon. Yep. Carbon4. K-A-R-B-E-N. The number four dot com is our website. We're on Facebook, Twitter. Nice. Instagram, all that stuff. Can people, I don't know what the laws are with alcohol, can they order it online? Unfortunately, they cannot. They cannot. I really, really wish, one of my big developmental things is finding a way to figure out e-commerce, and it's a big topic in craft right now, because there are some states you can mail to, but not in Wisconsin. If we ever can, we will for sure, Um, but for now, you have to buy it it here or at one of our, our customers. Gotcha. Locations. All right. So. Fair enough. Yeah. So currently in Madison, Wisconsin, yeah. ready to take over the world. Oh, sure. As yeah. soon as the laws allow. Intergalactic <laughs> domination. Yeah. That's Nothing awesome. less. Yeah. Well, thank you, Zach. This is super cool. This has been Authentic Business Adventures, the business program that brings you the struggle stories and triumphant successes of business owners across the land. Authentic Business Adventures is brought to you by Calls on Call, offering call answering services for businesses all over the country at callsoncall.com as well as draw in customers business coaching, offering business coaching services for businesses looking for growth. And of course, the Bold Business Book, a book for the entrepreneur in all of us, available wherever fine books are sold. We'd like to thank you, our wonderful listeners, as well as our guest, Zach Koga, the co-owner of Carbon 4 Brewing. Zach, uh, this is cool. Yeah, thanks for coming in. I'm excited. I'm all of a sudden very thirsty, so I love coming (laughs) to breweries. This is so cool. Yeah. Um, Can you tell us the website one more time? Carbon4.com. Awesome. Thank you guys for listening. We'll see you next week. I want you to stay awesome. And if you do nothing else, enjoy your business.